Brightside is now part of the curriculum in the marketing department. So there's a class about um, social entrepreneurship and social impact that um, the faculty member for. And as part of that class, the students are are operating Brightside. And so they're getting this hands-on experience of operating a business, but it's not just any business. It's a business that's actually having this really important impact in their local community. Welcome to Startup Talk with Millard and Andrew. Millard Chan and Andrew Moss launched this podcast to give a voice to the countless founders, angel investors, incubators, supporters, and startup events located in San Diego. Welcome back to Startup Talk with Millard and Andrew. Andrew, how are you doing, man? I'm having a pretty good day myself. How about you? It's uh, good. I mean, this is really going to be a busy week for us. Yeah. um, Why don't you start telling us about why it's going to be such a busy week? So uh, there's the John G. Watson Quick Pitch coming up. That's uh, 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 co-sponsored by Tech Coast Angel San Diego and San Diego Venture Group. And in previous years, this competition had been, or at least last year, it was recorded on a podcast uh, called The Pitch, which was recently acquired by Gimlet Media, and they've been too busy to do this. And so the organizers of Quick Pitch put a call out looking for a podcast um, that could step in to fill those shoes. Sure. And um, I think... Yeah, they were looking for a podcast that's pretty popular with a local following in San Diego. That sounds familiar. I think uh, we have a podcast kind of like that, don't we? Yeah. um, They're looking for people who have had... Uh, experience as investors or entrepreneurs and education. I think we tick those boxes also. Um, there needs to be some sort of a diversity element in there. Um, are you immigrant? I certainly am. You, are you an immigrant? Yeah, well, uh, sometimes people mistake me for one. <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, long story short, folks, uh, Startup Talk with Millard and Andrew will be recording at the John G. Watson Quick Pitch this year, and we Look forward to releasing some episodes with the 10 finalist uh, interviews with them, their actual pitches, judges' comments. Yeah, it'll be a little bit different than our normal podcast setup, but uh, we think it'll be really interesting, valuable information for you listeners, so stay tuned for it. Exactly. So we have another interesting guest on with us today. Uh, Mill, why don't you tell us a little bit about her? I am so stoked for this guest. So we are joined by Dr. Iana Castro, who is both an entrepreneur and an educator. She is currently an associate professor of marketing at San Diego State University, researching and teaching in the areas that include consumer behavior, retailing, and strategic marketing. She was awarded Outstanding Faculty Contribution Awards in 2015 and 2016 for professional development and service. And in 2017, she earned the Teaching Excellence Award in the Fowler College of Business. She is co-principal investigator for a project entitled Factors Influencing Food Selection that was funded by the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development. Thus, it's not surprising that Professor Castro is also the co-founder and faculty director of Brightside Produce San Diego, which is a sustainable SDSU student-run social venture that makes affordable, fresh produce more available and accessible in San Diego communities. Iana, welcome. Thank you for having me. So full disclosure, and, and for you to know, Andrew, as well, yeah. is um, uh, along with the Zulema Bibel in 2016, we uh, organized Unreasonable Lab in San Diego. We facilitated two of the cohorts there, and Brightside Produce was a participant in our second cohort. So that's where I met you, Iana, where you brought two of your your teammates along. Yeah, so my San Diego co-founder, Rafael Castro, was there, and also Adam Kay, who was the founder of Brightside, and he's actually in Minnesota, which is where this model was started. Uh, So the three of us attended the Unreasonable Lab. We were in the idea stage to figure out if it would work in San Diego, and so we went through the lab and and got some feedback um, before we had a chance to actually challenge the model and start coming up with how the model would work in San Diego. So the timing was really perfect for us, and and here we are now. We're looking. We're looking forward to Andrew and I. Are looking forward to digging deep into all that. But you know, let's let's take a, a step back in time, Iana. How did you and when did you know that you wanted to be a university professor? Yeah. So I always loved school. I loved being in school. I loved taking classes. And so when I was wrapping up my undergraduate program, I was really sad to be leaving. 
And so immediately I said, okay, well, I must stay here. So I started looking at graduate programs. And so I kind of had that drive to be learning and I was very um, just curious. And in my MBA program, kind of the same thing happened going through my program and then realized, oh my goodness, this is almost over. And I absolutely love being in this environment and I want to do it more, but I wasn't sure what my options were. And at that time I had a conversation with one of my professors in the MBA program and he encouraged me to look into PhD programs. And that's not something I had really considered before, um, but that conversation pretty much changed my life. It put me on a completely different path um, to where I am now, where I absolutely love what I do. And it's just an amazing career to have. So that's interesting. At the MBA level, you, you hadn't yet considered the teaching or PhD when you started the MBA program? No, I really was interested in kind of the strategic side of business. And so I thought, well, I'll go out and I'll work and um, I'll do that kind of work. And I love marketing and I love the consumer facing side of business. And so I really love the idea of going out in the world and, and working. Um, but I knew that I was going to miss being in school and being in the environment of academia and being around a lot of people who are diverse and have all of these different perspectives and strong opinions. Um, and so it was at that point that I kind of opened my mind to this idea, well, maybe I never have to leave. Maybe I can pursue academia as my career. Well, that's interesting. I mean, that's really you know, gratifying to hear for this you know, whole generation of, of, of people in undergraduate or, or master's programs that you don't have this preconceived notion of you want to be a teacher for, for, for a long time beforehand, that you can actually you know, develop an interest and then continue with your studies. Absolutely. And I tell my students that all the time. I teach mostly seniors. And so by the time they get to me, they um, are starting to realize that their life is, is really about to change. And then they're going to start making some really important life decisions. And I always encourage them to take a step back and to realize that the decisions that they're making are not going to be permanent, that they can try things and that they can change their mind, that they can always go back to school and study something related or different. And so to not look at it in such a kind of final way, but as a stepping stone to something else that may be similar or different. Yeah, I have to agree with you. When I was in my senior year of college, I, well, I had no idea really what I wanted to do. I just knew that I was going to be coming back to San Diego and, uh, I looked at jobs and just couldn't really figure out what, what I was going to do. And that kind of leads me to the next question in what do you think some things college students can do to make their time as an undergraduate more productive? I think some of the things that I would recommend is, well, the first of all, get involved. I think that there are a lot of initiatives going on on campus, and um, I hear it a lot from students where I'll, I'll bring something up that's going on, and they'll say, I wish I had known about this before, or I wish I had known about this last year, two years ago. And so I would recommend really kind of doing your research in terms of what's going on on campus, that you can attend talks, events, lectures, um, and then seeing what areas just pique your interest. And even if it's something that you never really have been interested in before, just go check it out because there is so much energy around so many different topics on campus. Um, and I would also say look for applied experiences. So there are a lot of courses that will try to get you outside of the class and into more applied situations. Like internships and things like like that? Yeah, like internships or um, even what I'm doing with Brightside, which we'll talk a little bit about, I'm sure. Um, but this idea that, you know, what you learn in the classroom can be applied outside of the classroom while you're still in the class is really valuable. And so any kind of experience that you're out in the world and not sitting in class is really, I think, going to be really valuable. Um, and then look for ways to kind of take action and make a difference. Again, college campuses have this wonderful energy where students really have the ability to get involved and make a change. And um, I think it's a great place to find what those things you're passionate about are and actually start taking action towards those things. And then finally, talk to people. <laughs> um, I think a lot of the students are stuck in their major, in their college, in their space, and they don't actually reach out and talk to other people that are doing things that are different from themselves. And I think that can also be really valuable. That is great advice. I wish I would have had more professors like you when I was in undergrad because, you know, most of what I remember, Andrew, is uh, just professors go, they walk into the class with their briefcase, put it down, teach, class is over, they leave. That's it. End of discussion. There's no career development or... And even at the office hours, a lot of them aren't very responsive in general. It's usually just about the homework. They don't have time to talk to you about your career prospects. And uh, it's a little demoralizing sometimes, to be honest. Yeah, just enough to get by. And you were talking about 
um, find out what you like, right? So what made you choose marketing? So I think my dad being a business person got me interested in business to begin with. I was always kind of interested in what he was doing and what he was working on. Um, and I think his career and how much I kind of learned from him as a child and kind of seeing what he did really influenced my choice of going into business and marketing and also the type of research that I do. Um, so I think it was just kind of that influence and that got me interested in that space. And what about your research resonates with you most? So my research looks at how consumers make decisions in different consumer environments. And what I like the most about it is that we're all consumers. And so it's really relatable to people. So I can say if I'm doing research on how parent and parents and children make decisions. Um, and I talk to a parent and they say, what do you research? I'm like, oh, I'm trying to figure out how parents and kids make decisions. They're like, oh, I can tell you all about that because I am a parent and you know, here are some of the experiences I've had with my child. Um, so I think that's what's really nice is that I can talk to people about my research out in the world. Exactly. It's relatable. It mm-hmm. is. And and they can understand it and they're, they're interested in it because they want to understand more about themselves as consumers. Um, and so it makes it really fun for me to be able to talk about my research, which which is not always the case for researchers. Well, what are some of the you know interesting tidbits that you've learned in your research? I think what most people don't realize is that we are influenced by our surroundings without us even realizing it. And so there are so many different things that are kind of moving us in one direction or another when we're making decisions. And because we're not aware of it, we're not able to correct and we're not able to realize that we're being influenced in certain ways. Do you hear that, Facebook users? <laughs> yeah, purely in the subconscious there, huh? <laughs> yeah. So the type of research that I do is I try to understand what's happening and then I try to kind of put the information out there so that as consumers we can be better informed and we can better understand what influences us so that if we feel that we need to make adjustments, we're able to do that. And in some cases, we're not able to. There's just, it is how we react and it is how we respond. But in other cases, there are things we can do to become better decision makers and consumers. So it's interesting that you study that, but how would the average person on the street put that into practice so that they're not so, you know, manipulated or that they, they can make better decisions on their buying? Yeah, so my research um, right now is really focused on food decision making. And so I'm trying to figure out what's influencing people to select certain products at the store when they're shopping and what are ways to kind of encourage healthier choices. And so um, one of the papers that I'm working on right now is kind of looking at everything that's been published that could be helpful to the consumer and preparing for their shopping trip and realizing when they're in the store and in going through the shopping process. Um, And so the outcome of that can be a guide for the consumer that says, if you want to be efficient at the store and you don't want to make purchases that are going to be not healthy, even though you plan to be really good, you might make some choices that are not in line with what you really want. Here are some of the things you can do. So you can make a list before you get to the store. Once you're in the store, you can make sure that you're keeping track of how much you're spending. So, if, you know, there might be budgetary restrictions. Um, things like paying with cash are really valuable because it's really salient when you pay with cash. You feel it as opposed to just putting everything on the credit card. Um, and so we can kind of provide tips for consumers um, in that space to kind of help them map out what they need so that when they go to the store, they're not making these sequential choices that eventually wear them down to the point where they're potentially not making the best decisions. 100% agreed. Yeah, it's too easy just to make all these impulse purchases and you're not really uh, taking into account the, the cost of everything when you just put it on the card. Just dump it in your cart, go to the checkout, and you just swipe the card as opposed to the old days where you actually have to take out your bills and count them out and then be pained every time you take out big bills. 100% agree. And I mean, for me, the worst time is to go when I'm hungry because I end up just putting things in the cart that definitely, definitely don't need to be in there. And uh, you get there and you realize, oh, well, that was a mistake, you know? Yeah. And then another layer that I look at is then what happens when other people are with you. And so you're already having these... Oh, peer pressure. So children or... Or distractions, I guess. Or distractions or significant others or... um, And so you're already... It's already a struggle (laughs) to get through the shopping trip in the best way possible. And then the reality is in a lot of cases you are with someone else. And so how does that person being there influence what you're doing? Someone actually being in the aisle, even if they're not shopping with you, can influence what you choose. And do you think about these things when you're shopping yourself? I do. Um, I like to watch people, which is not always the best thing. (laughs) (laughs) Who is that lady? you looking at us, mom and dad? Yeah, so I like to observe behavior and I, I like to be as, as 
careful as possible not to be creepy. Um, but yeah, I, I try to kind of look at my own behavior and the behavior of the people around me and kind of think about, you know, why do they do that? And, and then I'm able to study it, which is what's really exciting to me is that uh, this is really interesting to me. Consumer psychology is interested to me. So if I see something in the world and I go, I wonder why that's happening, I can actually take a step back and, and study it, which is really exciting. So we mentioned um, bright side produce before earlier. Love to find out uh, about the genesis of bright side produce, but I can just imagine now having the through line between your research and how that could, how you could help to influence, you know, good healthy behavior um, through bright side produce. Yeah. So I, tell us about bright side produce. So Brightside is a produce distribution company, essentially, that's run by students. Um, and what they do is they deliver fresh fruits and vegetables to stores and underserved communities. And so there is a huge distribution challenge for these small stores in getting the products that they need. Um, and so a lot of the research that I was doing was in figuring out how consumers make decisions based on the options available. But then the question is, what happens when the good options, the options that they should really have, are not available in the store? Um, and that's what's happening a lot with corner stores. They're not getting the right products, but it's not because they don't want to carry those products. It's because the distribution system isn't built to serve these small stores, and so they get what they can get, but it's not always the best stuff. Yeah, that's so interesting. So um, unlike folks here in Southern California, um, I grew up in New York City. And so I'm familiar with a lot of corner stores and where I grew up in the Latino neighborhood is bodegas. And you go into these places and compare and contrast that with what you can find in a supermarket. Supermarket, you've got access to healthy, fresh vegetables and, and, and perishable goods. You go into a bodega and it's mostly canned food with preservatives, high sodium content, uh, chips, um, you know, processed foods. And it's very difficult to make a healthy decision. But I hadn't realized that maybe a large part of that reason was because of the distribution logistics to get to these small corner stores. Yeah, and so distribution is a huge challenge. And there have been a number of attempts to address this. Um, you know, a lot of communities rely solely on these stores. They do not have access to a supermarket. And so what that store carries is what they, they can get. Um, and so one of the big issues with distributing to these small stores is from the distributor's perspective, it's very expensive to do that final delivery. So that final step in getting it to the store costs them a lot of money. And so they usually have minimum order requirements so that they can be profitable as distributors in getting the products out. Small stores are small. And so they're unable in a lot of cases to meet those minimum order requirements, which then means that they're not getting the service from the distributor. And this is an issue not just with fresh produce, but also with other uh, products that they would want to carry. And what percentage of the well, population here in San Diego are shopping at these small corner stores where they're not able to get these good choices? So in San Diego, we have kind of pockets throughout the county where people are kind of relying on these smaller stores rather than the bigger stores. And so we have a high level of food insecurity. And um, one of the reasons that people are food insecure is because they lack access. So with food insecurity, you lack, you know, if there's lack of access, there's lack of availability, or there's lack of affordability. And so we are actually trying to address all of those issues in the communities in San Diego that don't have access potentially to a supermarket nearby. Um, and so a lot of people will say, well, you know, if there's a supermarket a mile away, isn't that good enough? And my response is not if they're depending on the store that's two blocks away. So if they are shopping at that store, that store should carry the products that they need for a happy and healthy life. And so it is a widespread issue in San Diego. So people that are maybe the elderly, uh, folks with children don't have access to a car for whatever reason, and, you know, like unlike places like San Francisco, New York City, the public transportation system in San Diego is not that great. Yeah, and, and people are surprised to know that we have this issue in San Diego, that there are such high numbers of food insecurity, that there are areas that are food deserts, which are areas that don't have a supermarket nearby, that we have food swamps, which are areas where there's a lot of kind of fast food available, but not good food available. Um, and it's happening all over the county. And so um, when we started Brightside, we had a group of students do research on where 
would be the best place for Brightside to start because we know this is happening in different parts of San Diego County. Where should we focus on initially? Um, and we found that National City was the best place for us to get started, which is where we're operating now. Um, but we have a ton of expansion potential within San Diego because this is, again, something that's, that's widespread. I mean, there must be pockets of food deserts north, east, as well as south in National City. Yes, there are. This, this might be jumping a little bit off topic, but I have a question about the school lunches they provide at the public schools. Do you deal anything with that and how unhealthy those some of those meals are and how that could potentially be another connection for Brightside? So I don't um, work with the school lunch programs and I don't know that much about them other than I've talked to a few people who are trying to do more of the farm to table within schools. And there have been a few schools and school districts that have been really successful with that. Um, What we're trying to do and um, related to schools is make sure that schools... Uh, that have these stores near them have the fresh produce available. So we have a store in National City that's about two blocks from an elementary school, and so they get a lot of the traffic of, you know, the morning traffic of walking the kids to school and the afternoon traffic of coming home. And so they were kind of one of the stores that got this started because it was important to have good stuff at that store where there was this constant traffic of families and children walking by. So is Brightside Produce uh, an independent social venture, or is it a part of San Diego State University? What's the relationship? So uh, it's housed under the San Diego State University Research Foundation, Um, and so we operate under their nonprofit umbrella. And so um, because we're housed in the university, we have a number of of wonderful benefits. So um, Brightside is now part of the curriculum in the marketing department. So there's a class about um, social entrepreneurship and social impact that um, the faculty member for. And as part of that class, the students are, are operating Brightside. And so they're getting this hands-on experience of operating a business, but it's not just any business. It's a business that's actually having this really important impact in their local community. Um, and so being a part of the university has given us the ability to kind of reach students who are passionate about this, get them involved, um, and also kind of get the support from the university community. Sure. And tell us a little bit more about how it's managed and operated by the students. What what kind of jobs do they do? So the way it's set up is that we've tried to set it up as much as possible like a typical company. So there's different departments and the students decide what department they want to be a part of. And so, for example, we have a buying team and they're the ones who put in the produce purchases every week. Um, we have a store relations team and they're the ones who actually make the store deliveries, they build the relationships with the store owners, and they actually do all of the things that we do in the store, which is a lot. So we provide the store owners with fixtures, we provide them with marketing materials, Um, the students take inventory for them and suggest what they should order to make sure that they're not over-ordering or under-ordering for their store. We give them recommended pricing to make sure that their pricing is affordable for the community. And then something else that we do that's really cool is we offer the store owners a risk-free guarantee. So if the produce spoils, we'll reimburse them for it and we'll actually take it out of the store. And in a lot of cases, it's still good. It's just not pretty to sell. Um, And actually what we pull out of the stores, um, we donate to the nutrition center in National City and they turn it into prepared food. And so um, we do a lot with our stores to make sure that they're successful in, in selling the produce, being profitable and getting the support they need from us in order to carry this product. Um, And then we have students who work on um, the marketing and the communication side. They run our social media accounts. They do our community engagement. We have students that do program evaluation and customer satisfaction. So they do surveys to make sure that people are happy with our service. And then we have a team of students who are responsible for the sales of produce on campus. And our sales of produce on campus are what help support our deliveries to the stores. And so the students select what kind of capacity they want to be involved in, and then they actually carry out those positions for Brightside. That's unbelievable. What you described, Iana, seems to be just a massive operation. And so how could the students be going to school while doing this? How could you be teaching or other faculty members who are involved in Brightside Produce? How how can you, how how is it managed? So I manage it As a class, so there's always going to be kind of these components. And so what's really cool about this this particular course is I do have the support of my co-founder, Rafael. So he um, helps me um, with supervising the students and making sure that everything is running smoothly. And um, 
the students step in and they kind of know that there's going to be a, a time commitment, but that time commitment corresponds to the number of credits that they're getting. So I think they're spending probably as much time as they would on a class that they really like, um, but they're spending their time in a different way. Instead of sitting in lectures and reading a book, they're actually, you know, we have our team meetings, the check-ins, the updates, and then they're off and actually executing the different functions. And so it, it, Yes, it was very hard to coordinate. <laughs> well, well, they're getting something so invaluable, which is real life experience. I mean, when I was in college, I had nothing like that. We had group projects, but they were all completely just uh, imaginary ideas. It kind was of never cl- put into real life like situations. A closed systems, exactly. as opposed to an open system like this. And so, have you thought forward to what happens in the switchover between semesters? So, students complete the class, they move on, new students come in. And how does Brightside? Uh, what's the continuity plan in that case? Yeah, that's a great question. And so we've been very blessed that once students kind of get involved with Brightside, a lot of them choose to continue to be involved. And so we actually launched Brightside in June. And so um, our store operations, and we didn't have any classes and we didn't have a students enrolled in a class to help us. And so we actually found students who wanted to just do internships in this space. And so over the summer, we were running on volunteers who were doing internships and they were wonderful. And then as the semester started, they were like, hey, we like this. We want to stick around. And so they actually helped the new team transition in when it came to the store relations. And already I'm hearing from the current group of students that they would like to continue to get a, to be involved after the semester is over. And so I think in terms of uh, switching stuff over, I'm always going to be there. Raphael's always going to be there. But we do have some students who will choose to continue to be involved. And then in terms of the course, um, the course will continue to be offered. And so the students can choose to continue to be involved as volunteers. They can choose to be involved uh, through the course. They can choose to do an independent study. So there's a lot of opportunities for them to become involved. And they're so excited about it. I think it's not going to be as big of an issue as, as, as I actually even I thought it would be in terms of continuity. I mean, that congratulations, Iana. That is amazing what you've been able to do to be, you know, teaching full time, doing research as well as you know directing uh, Brightside Produce. That's that's a big that's a BHAG back in B school terms, big hairy audacious goal. It's really amazing what you've been able to do for the greater community. Thank you, and I love what I'm doing, and so I think that <laughs> that's important point to point out. All of the things that I'm getting involved with are are just things that I'm really passionate about and really excited about. And when I you know interact with the students and I see how excited they are, and we talk to the store owners and they're excited and there's just such good energy around it um, that it, it's really just keeps us moving and going forward and, and seeing what's going to be next. So it's been a really wonderful experience. Yeah, I was going to ask you about the feedback from the stores. It's, has it all been generally positive and, and how many stores are you in right now? So we're in six stores right now, but today two stores got set up with their coming soon um, materials, which a week before we deliver the, for the first time, we try to put out coming soon signage so that the community knows that the store is going to have the fresh produce available if they didn't sell produce before. Um, and so we're going to be at the end of this week, essentially, we're going to be starting with eight stores. And our growth plan is to grow by one store per month. And we've been able to, to do that. Um, we are a little bit constrained on our resources. So we've outgrown our delivery vehicle, um, which is kind of our, our first major challenge that we're facing now that we're up and running is that we're trying to get a donation for a delivery van because we're servicing so many stores that it's a lot of uh, merchandise. Um, but we have been able to keep up with our growth plan. And the response from the stores has been very positive. And so the store owners, they really like the service. And I think we put a lot of effort into making sure that we were providing a, a full suite of services so that they could carry produce successfully. They really like working with the students. And so our students who are out in the stores every week have built personal relationships with our store owners. Um, and we've done a lot to generate awareness in the community about Brightside and to try to encourage community members to support our Brightside stores. And so we're saying, hey, we're going out there and we want the community to have this. But in order for this to be successful, we need you to come into these stores and support them. Of course. Because they're also taking a risk by carrying carrying this, even though we're trying to, we're trying to it carry sounds, the risk yeah, for yeah, them. It sounds like their downside is fairly low considering you, you pick up the food that it may be going bad. So it seems like, yes, their, their risk is much lower than yours, I guess, huh? But you still have to overcome inertia. So if the inertia is, is the corner store has been doing business this way for decades, you know, why would they want to change a good thing? So a couple of questions I want to, you know, delve into before I forget is, 
uh, funding. How does Brightside was it? How was it initially funded, and what's the future funding plans? And also, how do you get the word out to add on new stores for the growth? Okay, so in terms of our funding, um, we were able to launch through the very generous funding of the SAGE Project, which is um, another program on the SDSU campus. And what SAGE Project does is it partners with local governments, and essentially the governments provide a list of projects that they need help with, and then SAGE Project finds classes where students can work on projects to help those cities. Um, and so this issue of improving the corner stores is something that has been going on since SAGE Project had a partnership with National City. Um, back in 2014. They were partners for two years. And so they were really supportive of getting Brightside started. Their director, Jessica Barlow, was incredibly supportive. And so they actually provided us with startup funds um, to be able to do the kind of the displays. We were really set on making sure that we had the proper merchandising and the proper materials for the store. Um, and so they provided funding for us to get started. Um, we started with store services in June and our funding model relies on sales of uh, produce on campus. And so the way that it works is um, students on campus, faculty and staff, they can sign up for a produce subscription and there are a number of different packages available. Is this like a co-op model? It's kind of like a CSA model. That's except, right, CSA. Yeah, and so the idea is that they can sign up for as little as $5 for a bag of produce. And this is great for the students who live on campus because there's not really that good of access to um, fresh produce on campus. We just not have a Trader Joe's, which is wonderful. Um, but this is meant to be like a really simple, convenient way to just get a bag of produce every week. And so the funding model for Brightside essentially relies on the sales of our produce subscription on campus to then help cover the cost of our distribution to the stores where we're really not trying to essentially charge anything. We're just really trying to provide the service for the store owners and the community. And so how's that going in terms of the on-campus sales of the it's going produce. really well. So uh, the program launched, launched in the fall, and so essentially we were running our, our store operations um, without the buyers. We call it the buyers club, without the buyers club for a little while. And so we were excited um, to finally have money coming in from the buyers club. Um, and it's only been a few weeks, but we have seen growth and people are signing up and they're excited about it. And um, I think one of the key things that our marketing uh students and essentially the marketing team of our Brightside company are working on is building awareness on campus so that we can build up our buyers club. Because what we tell people is if we can build up our buyers club and get more money coming in, we can help more stores faster. And so our growth plan of one store per month is conservative. Um, and if we can get more money, in, then we can grow faster, um, as, you know, assuming we can get over the, the challenges of you know, delivery ban and all of that, which we will. Has the primary vehicle for um, marketing on campus been through social media channels? Social media, talking to classes, um, doing... We are at the farmer's market at San Diego State, and so when people are walking by, we have a, a sales team that's present there talk, telling them about um, Brightside and what we're doing. And so it's been... Um, I think it's been working really well, but it's really new. And so we're definitely in that stage where we just absolutely just need to build awareness um, for Brightside in general and then for why these sales on campus are so important. And so I think that's going to be something that's going to be a little bit um, of time in the making. But once we get going, I think it's going to do really well. And what's the most surprising thing you've found since you started Brightside? I think I've been really surprised by how positive the response has been to Brightside. I think, um, don't get me wrong, I got a lot of no's. No, 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 no. Um, but I think generally people have been really excited. They've been really positive about what we've been trying to do. And they've been really supportive, either just supportive in um, saying, hey, I'm here if you need anything, or supporting with actually saying, hey, we can provide this for you, or here's a resource that you need. Um, and so that's been really energizing for us because it's been it's taken a long time to get this up and running, and it is complex, and that's why. Um, but I've just been really surprised by how much people want to help and how much energy there is around making this food access issue essentially go away, at least when it comes to produce. Is this type of model common on university campuses in the United States, or is this a unique type of thing? 
Not that I'm aware of. And so the program was started um, in Minnesota at St. Paul, and um, they are up and running. They've been up and running for over three years. And so when we started, we essentially looked at their model and said, okay, what are the let's challenge the model. Let's make sure that this is something that we can bring to San Diego. And then once we started challenging the model, we realized, okay, we're going to have to make changes to the model for it to work here. Um, And so we've been um, really good about documenting what we're doing. And so it's my hope that as we grow and we learn and we figure out how to make this um, something that someone else can just grab and go, we can pass that information along to other university campuses because I think there's a lot of value for everyone involved. And I think that's really magical about Brightside. That's pretty cool. So in terms of on-campus, I'm pretty sure you've got that covered in terms of your outreach on social media and also talking to students on classes. But what other type of resources in the San Diego region would you would you love to have I think I've been able to build a lot of connections. I think that what I didn't realize when I started this was how many people were working in this space just in different ways. And so some of the resources that have been really helpful for us um, have been just making those connections and learning from others who are already working in this space. Um, And that's been really, really helpful and valuable. And just attending events and talking to people about what we're trying to do and getting feedback. Um, So I think San Diego has a really kind of great entrepreneurial spirit. Uh, San Diego State University has a lot of entrepreneurs. We're known for all of these wonderful initiatives and companies that come out of the university. Um, So I think this space has made it very, I wouldn't say it's been very easy, but it's made it very nice to try to do something like this. Um, So I think San Diego has the mindset and the people to support initiatives like mine. Are you aware of the Alliance Healthcare Foundation? I'm not. Okay. So Nancy Sasaki is the executive director of Alliance Healthcare Foundation, and it's amazing what they do. Do you know that every year they have an innovation challenge whereby the winners could get up to a million dollars? Oh, my goodness. And it's only for <laughs> um, nonprofit organizations or fiscal fiscally sponsored projects. That has to do with finding better products and services and methods to improve health and well-being, including food insecurity. And so I would definitely, you know, advise you to, to look into that because they give away not insignificant amount of money, a lot of money. That sounds wonderful. I'll have to check that out. And do you have any advice for entrepreneurs who are looking to get into a social enterprise, uh, starting their, starting one themselves? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that I was really set on when this all started was um, in doing my research and making sure that I knew exactly what was going on in the environment that we were going to walk into. And obviously, I think that's part of my professor business background. Um, But some of the things I would say is make sure that you understand what you're doing and then that you understand the environment that you're walking into with your venture. Um, I think it's really important to have a deep understanding of that before you make any decisions. Um, I think a lot of people um, get really excited and then they don't have all of the information that they need in order to be effective when they actually enter the market. Um, I would say also challenge your model and challenge yourself. Um, Don't be too protective of your ideas. I think a lot of the times, um, and we all experience this, you've been working on something for such a long time and then somebody, you know, tries to, to kind of find holes in it and it could be upsetting, but in reality, they're helping you, right? They're giving you feedback of something you may have missed or something you may need to rethink, or you might find that the feedback is not that helpful, um, but stay open to kind of those challenges that come up and, and challenge yourself in the process as well. Um, and then find supporters. I think throughout this whole process, I've been really Like I said, I've been really happy with the positive response that I've gotten. And I think that people ultimately want to support you. And so find people to be your cheerleaders. And it's it's hard and it's tiring and it's a lot of work. And so it's nice to have people who support you um, in multiple levels, you know, make sure that you have the support that you need. Um, And then be persistent. As I think I briefly mentioned, I got a lot of no's. Um, along the way, like lots and lots of no's. And I never took no for an answer. And, you know, I was more interested in finding solutions to the no's and understanding where it came from and how to 
work with the information I was given. Um, so it's easy to get discouraged, but if you're persistent, eventually you kind of, sometimes you just have to be persistent and people will just say yes to get you to go away. Other times you'll find solutions to, to the problems and either way it'll get worked out. That's that. Those are great words for any entrepreneur to t- to take to heart. Yeah, whether it be social enterprise or just their own startup that's uh, looking to make uh, in the money in the for profit world. So, absolutely, exactly. As we wrap up the episode, what's the best way for people to contact you if they have more questions? Yeah, so please check us out. Our website is brightsideproduce.org under the San Diego tab. You can also follow us on Instagram and Facebook and on Twitter. Um, and you can reach us at brightsideproducesd at gmail.com. And I'd be more than happy to um, answer any questions, get any feedback, any comments. I, I would love that. That's great. Uh, you can hit us up at Startup Talk Pod on Twitter. Hit me up personally at Millard Y. Chan. Send us an email, startuptalkpodcast at gmail.com, or check out our website, startuptalkpodcast.com. Well, Iana, thank you so much for, for sharing your story with us today. Yes, thank you for having me. Yeah, we had a great time. That concludes another episode of Startup Talk with Millard and Andrew. Let's get started. Hey, folks, please subscribe to Startup Talk with Millard and Andrew on iTunes and rate and review us. It helps other people find this podcast. This episode was produced by Millard Chan and Andrew Moss. Our sound editor is Lee Liang. Additional voices from Mindy Nguyen. Our theme music is Good Times by Pottington Bear from soundofpicture.com. Our podcast Sherpa is Charles Wilchett. <laughs>